All right, we're live. Welcome everybody as you get situated. We are gonna be kicking off in about 60 seconds. So settle in, grab that cup of coffee. We will be moving forward. Okay, I have 11.15, does everybody else have 11.15? Perfect, well welcome to the 2020 joint meeting between the San Diego chapters of the CCIM Institute and IRAM, the Institute of Real Estate Management. We're delighted for you to join us on this beautiful San Diego morning. We have an incredible lineup of panelists this morning who will bring you up to speed on how industry leaders are adapting to this rapidly changing real estate environment. I'm Doug Tabor, Vice President of the CCIM San Diego. You may know me as a local rental housing realtor with Keller Williams, KW Commercials, La Mesa office. My distinguished co-host this morning is the President of the San Diego Chapter of IRAM, Ms. Lucinda Lilly, Vice President of FBS Property Management. Next screen, please. A little bit of housekeeping this morning. Just so you know, attendees are in listen-only mode can chat and can use the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Please use the Q&A box to submit your questions for panelists. We really wanna make this uh, open for your questions and the panelists are excited to receive them. Uh, just so you know, this webinar is being recorded and will be shared following the event. And you can also use reactions by clicking chat and using the toolbar at the bottom, Zoom gives you a number of ways to creatively express reactions throughout the program. Next slide, please. Here is our agenda for the morning. We are going to do a quick welcome of CCIM and IRAM. We're gonna recognize our sponsors, which we're so very grateful for. We're gonna introduce our moderator this morning, Mr. Dennis Cruzan, audience poll, and then we're gonna start the program, introduce the panelists, start the discussion in the Q&A. And we should be completed, wrapped up today by 12.45, at which time we will do some raffle prizes from our sponsors. And now a little bit about CCIM. In case you were wondering, CCIM stands for Certified Commercial Investment Member. The CCIM lapel pin denotes that the wearer has completed advanced coursework in real estate economics and investing, shown proven industry and experience, and it culminates in a final exam, which I'm here to tell you is quite extensive. Uh, as a local chapter, we focus on educating uh, and networking events like this one that promote excellence, competency, and collaboration. Uh, if you wanna find out more about your local chapter, the CCIM, about how you too might be your, able to earn the CCIM designation, uh, and many of our upcoming events, please tune in to our website at CCIMSanDiego.com or our newly formed LinkedIn page. Now, if I could take a moment, I'd like to thank our generous sponsors of the CCIM chapter for the year 2020. Our platinum sponsors include Chase Commercial Lending, Hecht Solberg, Marcus and Milchap, Marsh McLennan, Procopio, and Savills. Our gold sponsors are CoStar, Exeter 1031 Exchange Services, Lankford & Associates, Pacific Medical Buildings, Slat Capital, SCS Engineers, Global Hotel Network, Voice Real Estate Services, South Coast Commercial, Pacific Western Bank, and the Port of San Diego. We thank you for your continued support, especially this year in 2020. And now it's my privilege to introduce my co-host this morning, IRAM's chapter president, professional coach, speaker, trainer, and agent of growth, 
Miss Lucinda Lilly. Lucinda? Thank you, Doug. What a very nice introduction. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. As an introduction to the Institute of Real Estate Management, I will inform you that the Institute was founded in 1933 with ethics as its cornerstone. We are a professional organization that's international. We provide quality education. We prepare our members with knowledge for day-to-day, -day, one of a kind, from solving the latest tenant crisis to analyzing market conditions. Our membership is 20,000 leaders in both the commercial and residential rental, excuse me, real estate management profession. IRAM San Diego celebrates its 73rd anniversary this year, and our chapter boasts over 400 members. Next slide, please. I'd like to thank our sponsors for today. Our chapter enjoys 65 IRAM industry partners. 18 of them are today's meeting sponsors. ASAP Drain Guys and Plumbing, Brightview Landscape Services, CAM Property Services, and Harbro Emergency Services and Restoration are our platinum sponsors represented today. Our gold IRAM industry partners include AMS Paving, Apartments.com, Career Strategies, Inc., Countywide Mechanical Systems, Cox Business, Forensic Analytical Consulting Services, Integrated Facility Solutions, Highlights of San Diego, Jackson & Blanc, Keith Monroe Painting, Paragon Services, Sherwin-Williams, Sully Jones Roofing Company, Bester Pest Control. I believe that it's time for our audience poll so that we can gain an understanding as to who our audience is. That'll help our hosts and our panelists address our questions. Could we please post the poll? Dennis, how many questions are there on the audience poll today? Lucinda, are you asking me that? Yes, sir. Do you what was the question again? How many, how many questions on the audience poll today? Uh, two, other, two more polls coming. Okay, great. So if everyone could answer as they come up, we would greatly appreciate that. Lucinda, I think we were going to do the other two polls throughout the program. I don't know if Ellen was set for that or not, so. Gotcha. Well, then I'll just keep going if that's all right with everybody. Dennis, you ready? You bet. Before we, before we move on much further, I would like to share that uh, we have one additional sponsor today, and that's Hennessy Harrington from the San Diego Business Journal, who is our media sponsor, so thank you very much. Without further ado, I would like to introduce today's moderator. Dennis Cruzan is a founding partner of Cruzan, a company that brings hospitality and an experiential edge to development and investment in property management services in Southern California and the Pacific Northwest. He has over 35 years of experience in commercial real estate, including development, acquisitions, finance, leasing, and asset management. Among other appointments, 
Dennis was the CEO and chairman of Burnham Real Estate, now Cushman and Wakefield, a founder and principal of Centermark, and a development partner at Oliver McMillan, focused on leasing, acquisitions, and project management. Dennis received a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from San Diego State University and was a member of SDSU's jazz band. Go Aztecs! Dennis, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lucinda. Uh, honored, uh, really, to be part of part of this event, and it's it's pretty weird. I mean, obviously, we're all in incredibly weird times, and we've been going through a lot. And uh, doing a Zoom for IRM is even more interesting because I've been involved in numerous IRM and CCIM events, and uh, this one I feel like we're all a bit of a guinea pig because uh, this moderating on a Zoom call is new. Uh, we're going to do our best, but I know that Renee, Gary, and Andy are fired up to do this thing, and uh, you've got a great panel, so we're, we're really looking forward to it. Um, hopefully, we'll try and make this as interactive as we can. As, as Doug mentioned, there's a feature for chat and Q&A that questions will pop up. Feel free. Uh, don't be shy. That really just helps with making this as interactive as we, we possibly can make it. As I mentioned about guinea pig, I, for those of you who like to be on Zoom and then kind of get distracted by other things, you're going to get busted today because there's a new feature on Zoom. You may not be aware of it. And we're going to try it for the first time. We have the access to your, wherever you're sitting right now. There's a 360 degree, degree camera. We can watch everything you do. So if you're watching the baseball game, you're watching golf, which it started today, or at noon, Young and Restless is on, we will be able to see. So just be careful yourself, watch what you do, we can see you. Just kidding, we can't see anything, you're all muted, but uh, if you can pay attention to our great um, great panelists, that would be great too. Um, so introducing our panelists, um, we've got a great one. Uh, they're diverse on many different levels. Um, I'll start with Renee, and I've just gotten to know Renee through, through really through this process, and she's obviously a very much a go-getter, and what I love about uh, Renee's career, she's held some significant leadership positions. In addition to being president of CFI Capital Growth, she, excuse me, CFI, which has been rebranded, uh, which is a boutique multifamily management company, uh, approximately 30 apartment communities in San Diego County. She's also an asset manager for CFI, which is one of the affiliate firms where she's involved in managing three and a half million square feet of retail office and commercial space. 30 years experience, um, Again, lots of leadership. She was past president of IRM San Diego, San Diego County Apartment Association, and USD alma mater, and she's teaching a course there uh, in the MS program in property management. So her perspectives will be largely on the management side as a business leader, multifamily, and commercial. Andy is our Boston guy. Andy, are you in Boston right now or near Boston, or are you local? Uh, yeah, I'm actually in Cape Cod, so just south of Boston on the East Coast. But there back we go. go on Monday, so. Uh, uh, Andy claims to have played hockey at, at UConn. Uh, he, he claims to have also played some hockey with Cal, at, in Kalamazoo uh, in the professional ranks. He's been with, with, in the commercial real estate business now for 17 years, CBRE for the last five years. And Andy's focus really is both on office and in life science, and his focus is really on the tenant and user side. Um, global, national, regional basis, corporate real estate portfolio optimization, finance, uh, strategic analysis, labor analytics, anything having to do with how users make facility and, and real estate decisions, in addition to kind of the traditional brokerage and deal making. Um, Randy's, uh, uh, Andy's a, a, a board member of the San Diego chapter of the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, uh, been very active in our life science industry here in San Diego, and his perspectives will be both on office and life science. Our third panelist uh, really needs no introduction. He's been a fixture here in San Diego, a real estate provocateur, right, Gary? A real, is, that, is that good, no? Um, Gary, among other things, is a partner with London Mater, but he really has kind of become, I would call him San Diego's real estate economist. He's uh, seen on television, uh, heard on radio, and very much kind of considered a guru, an expert of, of real estate here in San Diego, advises companies all up and down the spectrum, went to Cal, used to work for a guy that we all knew, Sandy Goodkin, which is where Gary got to start. We've known each other for many, many years. He too is an instructor at the Burnham Moore Center for Real Estate at USD. And his perspectives will be on many levels, but with really with that knowledge and that strategic real estate 
real estate background. So we do have a, uh, and again, reminder everyone to please, by all means, throw in questions as you, as you, as you wish. Uh, but I do have a question for all three of you to get us started. It's the same question. And it's really kind of a, it's a reflective look at how COVID has affected both what you do day to day, how your career has changed, or how your work as, as in your career has changed. Has it been good? Has it been bad? Give us some perspectives of how your life has changed with COVID in your working experience. Renee? Well, good morning, everybody. Um, well, as you can see from my background, when I was deciding what to put up there, I decided that times are kind of rocky and everyone's kind of hanging on for dear life. Um, and so I kind of put the rock climbing picture in there um, and have to say, as far as my personal life, this is my daughter that I found this picture on Instagram. So yes, it gave me a heart attack, um, but I'm glad that there's outdoor activities for those who want to be outdoors. Um, I, in regards to me personally, I'm, I'm just personally just grateful to um, be a part of the property management industry and, you know, my family is healthy and, um, and, you know, I'm just trying to view things in a very simple way. Um, I am an optimist, so I need to say that before we, I say any other comments throughout the rest of this, um, this uh, time. But, you know, I do believe that we have a lot of smart people in the world that will help solve uh, the problem that we have at hand and that we just need to be keeping a healthy attitude and, um, you know, and, and just remaining balanced. I do want to touch a little bit on property management, though. Um, the property managers at CFI and CFI Capital Growth and throughout the country, um, it's just been an incredibly crazy time. Um, in San Diego, we started the year, you know, if you're a property manager, we had so much rain and all we were doing is, you know, dealing with water everywhere. San Diego was not built for lots of water. Then we rolled into the COVID situation. Then we rolled into protests and riots. And the best way to describe this that I heard from a, a property manager in another state was basically property managers are drinking from a fire hose and they have been for about seven months now. So it's been uh, pretty challenging. You know, when we started the year, you know, commercial was strong. We're like, how do we do things better? What capital improvements do we want to do on the properties? Like, how do we move things forward? Uh, residential, we were reeling a little bit from the uh, lovely rent control measures that have put in place. Um, but, not, but being real proactive and how do we make sure we keep income as high as we can keep it for our, our um, owners. And, uh, and then all of this happened. And instead of kind of really being proactive and forward thinking, we all of a sudden had to jump into keeping all the puzzle pieces together and keeping everything aligned. And you know, anyone who's in management understands that management matters. We're here because we understand that we matter, but we certainly, property managers manage more than anything right now. And um, uh, there's a lot of things that the property managers have to ha had to deal with. And I just want to share this. I saw that on the call, there were about a third that were property managers, some that didn't answer and then others in other areas. But just to give some insight to what, what managers are doing these days, um, obviously there's the facility side of it. When COVID uh, came out, you know, we had to deal with making sure the, the, um, the properties were in compliance with all the laws, make sure the cleaning was being done for the safety of our residents and tenants, you know, making sure appropriate signage was up. Um, there was obviously the financial management of each property that we manage. Um, and we couldn't look backwards to determine what was gonna happen in the future. So we had to look into this crystal ball and make decisions on what do we expect cash flow to be? What was income gonna look like? Can, is there anything we can do on expenses? Do any of our properties will they have an issue paying their debt service? Um, and, and kind of in a crisis mode having to evaluate that. The property managers also had to deal with employee issues. We had employees on site in office buildings and in, in apartment communities. We had maintenance technicians servicing um, both commercial and residential and how do we uh, keep them safe but keep operations running. Then we have, uh, you know, the leasing side. We can't just go, oh, well, we're in a tough time, so we're just going to let vacancies sit. We had to figure out how do you do virtual leasing, both on the commercial and the residential side, and be creative. And especially on the residential side, how do you make that personable? Because that is a personal experience. You're, you're trying to show someone their new home. You, we were dealing with commercial tenants. And, you know, typically, you know, you would check in how things are going. But we um, at CFI and CFI Capital Growth went in with this, we're in it together type of attitude. And I think a lot of other property managers and owners have gone in with their clients, uh, with their tenants this way on the commercial side and said, hey, how can we help you? Um, 
a lot of, uh, we spent a lot of time pushing information out to commercial tenants about the PPP, all the programs available to them to help them keep their business going. We need them going so that our clients can keep going. Um, and a lot of time was obviously spent on, you know, um, lease amendments, you know, are we deferring rent? Are we abating rent? Um, how can we creatively create space for them, outdoor spaces? So all this is just being done in a, in a couple of months time. On the residential side, you know, the last thing we want is anyone to be homeless. Um, but we did, we want our residents to pay their rent if they can pay it. We wanted to make sure they understood what the new laws were about the eviction moratorium, that the rent wasn't forgiven. So, you know, gosh, if you can pay something, pay it. Like, don't get too far behind or else you'll never get caught up. Um, we have some senior communities we had to pay attention to, really the, the safety of them and our cleaning protocol and also how to keep them um, not feeling so isolated. And then, of course, the clients, the owners of our properties. Um, you know, the, the amount of communication that is being done right now between both with our clients and with our tenants is exorbitant. Um, and the property managers that I have talked to are spending probably 80% of their time on the phone talking to tenants, talking to clients. And, um, you know, the clients, I you know, we're fortunate. Our portfolio is fortunate. Our, our clients have low leverage. Um, low debt on their properties, um, but where the challenge is coming in is, okay, now you're not getting your owner distribution. How does that affect them personally? So uh, it's been crazy. And uh, I had one of um, our property managers say, it's like I'm a psychologist because I'm not only talking to my clients and my tenants, but they're telling me about their personal lives, their family. And so a lot of information is coming in. So um, I'm going to take just a quick second and do a shout out to any of the property managers on the call because Thank you for what you do. It's amazing that you guys are juggling all this. Um, you all need to stay strong and just please remember, you can't do it all, forgive yourself. You know, you can't do everything. And so if something doesn't get done, you gotta forgive yourself and move on. So those are my comments. Thanks Renee. That was a great shout out to managers because I know in our organization, the last four months have been just really tough on manage managers. So thank you for doing that. Good, good recap. Uh, Gary, uh, how has COVID affected you, your career, your company, everything about it? How's it affected you? Well, good morning, Dennis. Good morning, everybody. Um, you know, I'm I'm in my uh, man cave at home, and I've been here for what six months now. Actually, I've been here for three years. So, in that respect, <laughs> in that respect, COVID hasn't uh, affected me. I made a career decision to let all my guys work up and the Carlsbad office, and um, we have a downtown office, which I use ceremonially, but I work uh, in an accessory unit that I built behind my home here in Point Loma. And uh, that's how I've been working the last few years. So from, in that respect, nothing's changed in my life. I mean, I'm working exactly how I've worked before. Um, with respect to, um, you know, personal life. I mean, you know, I, I thought a lot about what's changed in my life. And, and it, it, what's really interesting is that I realized that I have a lot more time to ride my bike. And I asked myself, why do I have all this extra time? And I realized that, well, I don't have to get up in the morning or go anywhere. So you don't have to take a shower. You don't have to get dressed. You don't have to get in the car. You don't have to attend meetings. You, you have a tremendous amount of, of free time that, um, uh, you can use for recreation or for thinking or to, uh, you know, enhance your business practices. So I think that's a, that's a major thing that's changed. And of course, in my life, personally, also, I've got three little boys and uh, we, we um, have had to adjust to uh, online learning. It looks like um, that's going to continue uh, through the fall. So that's, that's a big challenge, particularly because summer activities are, are uh, curtailed and you can only take so many trailer vacations, I guess. Uh, so, uh, with respect to our business, um, you know, real estate is the long game. And I think that uh, most of my work, which is uh, helping our clients understand what the market opportunities for the real estate development projects are, for their investments are, running pro formas, doing feasibility studies, these kinds of things. These are for deals and opportunities that um, won't, um, you know, won't, be projects that will typically be constructed for until an, an entitlement period is completed. So it will take several years. So a, a COVID event right now isn't yet affecting um, the uh, sort of the plans that were already in place. 
uh, that, that my clients had. It is affecting uh, opportunities that we're looking at or uh, it's affecting our, our sort of perspective, our change in the opportunities that our clients are looking at. So in that regard, um, a, lot ha a, lo a lot has changed. So as we proceed through this um, discussion, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. Andy, how about you? Obviously, it's, if you're back in the Cape, things are doing pretty well for you. It's the, uh, that's the benefit of, uh, of Zoom and, and CBRE implemented a model of uh, the kind of the workplace 360 years back. I don't know, Dennis, you've probably been through our office where, you know, everyone has the, um, uh, the free address set, set, set up. So, you know, once they shut down our offices, it was pretty much just make sure you bring your, your laptop charger home. And um, that was our big transition. Um, Renee, you're hundred percent right on the property management side. I, I don't know how you guys do it, especially with everything going on right now. I, I scratch my head every time, like how you guys get everything done and, and flawlessly and dealing with tenants who don't understand the backside of it. So um, definitely put some props out to you guys there for sure. You are rock stars. Um, personally, you know, it, it's been interesting. You know, I have a, I have a five and a six year old, um, 11 months apart, dangerously close. And, um, and my wife has a, has a busy profession as well. So now we've got everyone at the house, myself working out of my garage office, my wife working out of the main office and my kids doing homeschooling, um, which is just a challenge in itself. So, um, you know, that, that's, it's going to be interesting to see how the fall progresses, you know, with, with that. And even with everyone else, you know, you, you, you get a little bit, uh, sense of that human aspect when you're, when you're on calls and, people's kids are coming in and usually people that are very straight faced and, and buttoned up and their kid comes in and starts waving on the screen in front of 15 people on a pretty important phone call. You know, it's, it gives you that, you know, reset of, of what it's all about. Um, so that's been, you know, a positive aspect. And like you said, Dennis, it's very positive. You can work from anywhere nowadays. Um, you know, and, and tours are very much virtual for some of them and um, some of them not. Um, but back to the professional side, I do a lot of global portfolio work too as a part of my business. So I was starting to see the impact of COVID um, a lot earlier on things in China and Italy and parts of Europe. So I, I didn't, it definitely was a wake up call when it started, you know, coming closer to North America, but you were, you were, you were seeing the impact in, in a lot of these other transactions that were just stopping and offices shutting down and things like that, you know, kind of seeing that wave come, which was um, actually pretty scary once we realized it started coming in through here in February, March. So, um, but all in all, you know, luckily our family's safe and friends are safe and, you know, we'll get through it. We just have to adapt a little bit and, and figure it out. Thanks, Andy. Hey, Gary, so if you could maybe kick off a, a broader discussion on how you feel that, and I, and I realize we're going to talk more about, more about more than just COVID on this, but just to kind of help us set the stage, what what impact from your perspective will COVID have on our economy, both nationally, locally, long, short term? All right. Well, I'll, let me let me just give you some random thoughts, just to uh, be provocative and to um, offer up what I think is sort of the sober reality of where we are right now. There is not going to be a V-shaped uh, recovery. That that was a fiction that I think was. Uh, promoted in the media. Uh, it's never happened, uh, regardless of what the cause of an economic uh, downturn is, it's not gonna happen this time. Um, that's, that's pretty clear. Uh, that we're in for a long slog. Regardless of, um, of what's in our immediate and midterm future, once things do turn, and they will, and I like to tell people that I'm, I, I try to avoid telling people how old I am now, but I do tell them that I'm five recessions old and you can do the math and so that's actually a positive statement because it suggests that we've gotten through the previous uh ones and you know we'll get through this one as well everyone is a little bit different uh, this one is very very different uh and i think that um we will see the situation change the moment that we have and distribute a vaccine i think if there's one hugely important message that I'd like to put out there. It's that really nothing changes in terms of um, where we're at with respect to um, our, all the situations that everybody just articulated about themselves until we're inoculated. Of course, the next issue will be once we, the vaccine comes out, whenever it comes out, whether it's 
a few months or a half a year from now, which is amazing that it can even be that quick. Um, that will be the milestone from which we start to measure the prospects of, of, of a recovery. The issue then will be the anti-vaxxers, but if we can get enough people to buy in uh, quickly to, to a vaccine, and that's a big question in America, uh, then um, and we can be successful in that regard, then I think that um, that's the beginning of, um, uh, uh, of a recovery. So we're just in for a slog and the kind of a maintenance of the current situation uh, un, 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 until that, that happens. We're gonna talk a lot about um, throughout this panel about what the current situation is and we're gonna break it down by the different food groups. So I'm gonna avoid making some um, overall, uh, some specific uh, uh, comments on, uh, on that until I'm asked to do that later. Um, the other comment I would like to make, however, is that uh, this, we're in, there are two economies uh, that, that are going on in America right now. There is the, uh, I'll just call it sort of the professional services, able to work at home uh, economy, which most of us are engaged in. And then there's the main street or on the street economy. And I think what we have to be sensitive to is the fact that, um, I don't know about the rest of you, but I don't really know anybody that has gotten uh, other than what I, you know, some politicians and people that we read in the media, I don't really know anybody that's gotten sick from, um, from the virus. But uh, we know that there are a lot of people that have gotten sick, there are a lot of people that have died, and, it's not, and, it's, and it hasn't been an equal opportunity virus in the sense that it's, it's heavily impacted people in the main street economy, people that have to open stores, people that have to touch and be near other people. It's also heavily impacted the Hispanic economy. In San Diego County, just for instance, and I expect this is the case throughout America, um, the amount of uh, people that have gotten sick, that have tested positive and gotten sick from the virus is double to triple the actual proportion of the Hispanic population. So the Hispanics have been hit very, very hard um, uh, in particular. So it, it has had a sort of a racial and demographic component to it. And it, it, a lot of that relates to the fact that a lot of these people are in the service businesses. So it has not been an equal opportunity uh, recovery. With respect to our sector, um, it also hasn't been equal. And again, we're gonna sort of get into the, the details of the food groups in a moment. But depending on the part of the sector that you're in, you could be pretty much non-affected, and I think I'm speaking to segments of the residential sector, although there's some that have been impacted. Um, certainly for sale residential hasn't been impacted. Uh, that's pretty much been business as usual. To the very impacted, uh, such as the, uh, the hotel sector and the retail sector, although there are other circumstances which have you know, taken uh, in that sector, uh, may, gone from may, uh, sort of evolutionary changes to making it revolutionary changes uh, that, that have been caused by us having to go online and do our purchases that way. So there's a lot of sort of unequal aspects to this recovery. But I think um, overall what we're seeing is really bad numbers out there. Uh, the fact that um, interest rates are low. We just saw yesterday that the Fed didn't change the discount rate. Uh, that was going to be pretty obvious to everybody. But the fact that mortgage rates are low, that, that, uh, that loan rates are low, doesn't really matter when um, we're struggling with just you know, the huge issues of unemployment right now and um, you know, sort of a, uh, the, stop, the stop moment that we have in our, in our economy. So I think that what I wanted to say, just to sort of wrap it up, is that don't expect um, once we get the vaccine that we're going to see a rapid change in our economic prospects. We'll see a significant moment where we go from negative to positive. But it looks like it's going to take a couple of years after the vaccine comes out for things to sort of be in what I would regard as uh, reasonable, stabilized, full recovery mode. So I think what we have to do in all of our careers, regardless of where you pulled this morning, what portion of your career you're in, I think you have to uh, sort of look in the mirror and say to yourself, how am I going to you know, survive and prosper and innovate um, 
uh, over a couple of year period, not a couple of month period, because as I said, just to go full circle here, this is not going to be a, a, a V-shaped recovery. We're just not going to see a vaccine, and every, everything gets better. It's just not going to be that way. Um, with respect to real estate investments, um, it's a very confusing period. So, so normally you'd say that, well, here we are, the numbers are down, uh, that probably affects valuation, there are probably opportunities out there. The problem is, even the big guys are confused. We really don't know what those opportunities are. That hasn't really played out yet. So confusion is another aspect of where we are in the economy. So I think with that, uh, as an overview, Dennis, I'll stop. Thank, thanks, Gary. One question I had for you, there, in this time between now and the vaccine, I, I agree with everything you just said. Do you see government stepping in and solving this financially more so than they have, given the fact that this is largely a government-induced recession? for the right reason in, in, in the view of the spreading of the virus. But how, how do you feel on that? Just quickly, briefly. I don't think government is the solution. I think government has been, um, I think they're the problem, although don't get me started on the Trump administration because I think he is the problem. Uh, but I, I, I would tell you that at this point, state and local governments are doing, you know, they're strapped for cash too. And I don't know that, uh, that, that, that they're going to be a solution. They could make things worse. I mean, um, somebody spoke a few minutes ago about uh, rent control. I mean, we, we could impose rent controls. We could, we could continue uh, rent eviction moratoriums. I mean, things like that, and they, they can make it worse. We're finding that government is, is not very helpful in the permitting side right now, which is confusing me. They're very, very slow in processing permits uh, here in San Diego, at least, and I think other places that my clients are doing business. I don't get that at all. That's the one thing they could do to be helping the economy, but I don't see government helping. I think it's all about uh, companies and individuals um, uh, trying to make good decisions going forward. Great, thanks. Um, Ellen, would you mind putting up the, we've got another survey, and this is gonna be the second of three surveys we're going to do during this program, and this is the one on working remotely. Uh, should come up here soon. Hopefully, there we go. So this is a, a survey we'd like all of you to take just because it's gonna help help us with our, our discussion here. Um, Well, it's looking like, just to jump ahead of the poll here, it's looking like half of you plan to work remotely two or three days a week. I'm going to say 35% of you will be rarely or maybe one day a week. And then 14% of you don't plan on returning to the office at all. Uh, very interesting. That, uh, that is a lead in to this next question, which, and this is for Gary, Renee, and for Andy. Uh, the impacts of, of COVID on demand and density of office space is something we've all talked a lot about. And I know at least around our shop, it's kind of a daily discussion. What impacts do you think COVID will have long-term on, not short-term, short-term there's no one in offices now, but long-term, what impacts do you think that'll have on the future of office space? What impacts will it have on how we think about office and, and just kind of your general thoughts in that regard as we kind of dig down into the product types? Renee? Well, you know, it really, um, when we look at office, it really to me is coming down to more of uh, what the businesses are that are occupying the office spaces and if they will continue to have businesses. I know we just looked at the poll and, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, some people want to continue to work from home, but I know that many want to return to work and return to office and have the human interaction at work. I think what will happen is we're going to see much more hybrids of that. And so I do think that office space will be, will be required. Um, I do think executive suites, that type of office is going to hit, uh, take a big hit. That's kind of what uh, we're seeing now uh, because those uh, small businesses can easily just pick up and move home and not have that expense. And so I think there will be an, an impact in, in that small niche of office. Um, but, uh, but I do, I do think uh, there's still going to be, you know, 
businesses in office space. And, you know, my optimism is that it's not going to have a significant impact um, in the long run, as long as the businesses are staying alive. Andy, you deal obviously with a lot of companies and I'm sure this is a topic of conversation. What's your perspective on this issue? You know, there, there's, a, there's multiple perspectives, but my, my personal feeling and, and CBRE has a workplace solutions group as well that has published so many different white papers and thoughts on this. And, and I think a little bit still building the plane as you're flying it, but my sense is from talking to users um, in multiple markets, not only just San Diego, there's going to be that kind of um, like gathering space, right? You know, so there's going to be um, conference rooms that you'd be fitting more of a boardroom now is going to have five or six people in it, but you're still going to need that face-to-face -face interaction. So people are going to come into the, the office more of like, they work, they work from home, um, you know, two to three days a week. They come in on a Wednesday because they have two to three hours of meetings in the office, whether it's a, you know, a project team, you know, teaming rooms, things like that. I feel like there's going to be a lot more of that, um, you know, type of a setup. It, it, actual office space is not just going to go away. There's, there's got to be some sort of interaction with people there. Um, Renee, I think you're right on the, on that, you know, co-working type of space that's it's yet to be determined how that's going to pan out, but you just kind of see a kind of a tough road ahead. Um, you know, a lot of groups are pulling out of their Regis and WeWork sites, um, you know, around, around the country, just because it doesn't make sense right now um, to be paying for that. Um, so, you know, on the life science side, there, there's still some talk about um, the office portion of that shrinking, but those people all have to be in the office, be in the lab and stuff like that. And, I think we'll probably talk about that a little bit later, but um, I think on the office side, it's going to be, it's not going to go away. It's going to be more of that, you know, community gathering space with, you know, very optically, you know, readily seen cleaning solutions going on and things like that between uses. And Gary, as a working remote veteran, uh, what's your perspective? Sounds like you've got people scattered throughout the county. So. Yeah, we do. And we've been experimenting with work at home uh, successfully. For, uh, for a few years right now, it's really, um, I leave it to my team to let them work where they wanna work as long as we meet deadlines and we're productive. Um, I, I think Renee is spot on about, about co-working spaces. I see that, I've seen that for a few years as DOA and I see the, the COVID uh, situation is pushing it over uh, to, uh, to, to terminal for uh, at least the big companies. I think that some of the building owners will, um, will embrace that concept uh, and, and take out the middleman. So I think that's one aspect. The other thing that I think we're gonna see a lot of is um, uh, less subleasing. I think a lot of companies are going to downsize. So I think we're going to see uh, some, certainly uh, uh, long-term spike up in vacancy rates as more and more people work at home and companies are able to sort of tamp down their office needs, uh, which by the way is a long-term phenomenon anyway. I mean, when we were doing market studies back in the 90s, we were using a metric of 250 square feet per employee. Today, we're using, I don't know about you guys at CBRE, Andrew, and what you're seeing on the ground, but the studies that we do to project demand, we, we're normally using 150 to 180 square feet per employee. And that's not because people are getting skinnier. You know, it's, it's, it's you know, we're just way more efficient in terms of our needs and our use of office space. So again, that's, that's an area where the evolution has turned into a revolution. I would caution everybody though, it's not an accident that the big technology companies, the Googles, um, uh, Apples, and Microsofts, and others have invested enormous amounts of money in business campuses. And they are the very people that can do everything online. And yet they've chose historically not to for reasons that relate to the need for humans to be together and sort of cohabitate in their office environments. Our, our DNA is not changing. Because, because of this environment. There will be a stabilization at some point once we get you know, post-inoculation um, where people will come back to the offices. But what this event has told us is it invites the opportunity for flexibility uh, that we were all sort of playing with before and now we've made it into sort of a business lifestyle reality. So, so Renee, what happens then? Uh, how do you come on, on rent collections in your commercial portfolio, specifically office? And, and I can touch a little bit on some of our experience, and Andy, you may know as well, but what's been your experience given, given this turbulence in office and people not really in their offices? How has your rent collection been on, on, in your portfolio? Yeah, so you know, our rent collection has been 
exceptional. Um, it, you know, it's it's 89 to 100 percent. We're probably averaging in 98 percent. Like it's it's off the charts. It's like kind of very normal, but. I think it's a fake normal. Uh, the PPP has been a huge um, assistance to all businesses. And what I what I don't know, the crystal, I don't know what the crystal ball is. I have a feeling the crystal ball is going to tell me that things are going to get a little bumpy down the road here as soon as the PPP money um, runs out and if there's not additional assistances for businesses. So I think we have a very false positive environment right now. Yeah, I, I would share that. Our, our portfolio, you know, we've got 3 million feet in South, Southern California and the Northwest, and we're at about that 97, 8, 9%. It's, it's, it's a lot of work to collect it, but that's about where we are. And the question is, what's the future hold? And it feels like the longer we're out, if you will, it's just going to be more difficult for people to start to reconcile or downsize or whatever the case may be. So, um, and, and I guess the same question Renee, on the on the multifamily side, and I know that you know you're you're involved in quite a few properties on the multifamily. So a lot of them are privately owned and privately held. What what's the rent collection on those been uh, as compared to say the more you know the more larger institutional apartment projects that maybe Gary may have some visibility into. Yeah, so, you know, we're primarily in the B market um, throughout San Diego County, and again, um, very uh, we. We were nicely surprised about rent collections. Um, right now, we have only about 4% of our residents not paying their rent in full. And we have about 3% who are paying partial payments on their rent. Um, you know, we have some properties with zero delinquency at all. And again, a false positive, I think. Um, it feels really good right now, but the extra money in the unemployment um, checks that were going out, I believe was a strong, you know, contributor to strong rent to collections. Um, and, um, and so I, I think our future is going to be a little bit different right now. It looks better than we expected, but I think it's going to become more challenging. So, so with, with some of your owners though, you've got, you know, call them private owners. They're not large institutions mm -hmm. and you've got mortgage payment. You've got expenses haven't changed. You've got a diminution in, in rental income. You've got a murky looking future. Uh, you've got mortgage pay, as I say, you got mortgage pay, and then you've got the threat of these rent control initiatives. How does a smaller private investor deal with that? And it must put a fair amount of strain on you as a manager because you're kind of keeping things all together. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's actually very difficult emotionally because um, you know all of our clients are in, are independent owners, and so they're they're people to us. It's not an institution. We're not dealing with um, asset managers. You know, we've got a couple asset managers, but it really it's their money, and it's the the money that we would distribute to them uh, is money that they may live off or help their children or, or do whatever they do to contribute to their lifestyle, and so um, so it's difficult. Um, the properties again, I mentioned earlier are clients are you know, pretty conservative, debt is pretty low, and can the property function and debt service be paid with some decent sized delinquency? Yes. But where it really hits them is in their pocketbook, in the client. So I'm not seeing risk of losing assets or losing their properties, but their personal lifestyle and their personal goals um, are being you know, impacted ne negatively because of this. And Gary, how about the larger institutional multifamily owners? Do you have any visibility into kind of what's going on with them and their perspective of all this? I think that um, one thing that's happening in, in, in terms of housing is there's a big sea change going on in terms of the amount of people that um, are able to um, buy versus rent. We're, we're gradually becoming more of a rent uh, market versus um, people who can afford housing, particularly on the coast. And so uh, there's a, um, you know, this sector is very healthy. It continues to be um, invested in. I think that um, we're seeing a, a slowing down of acquisitions because we don't know where revenues are going to fall or when things are going to stabilize. So in terms of the dynamics of investments right now, they definitely slowed down lenders and underwriting and inequity uh, capital has, has just sort of put themselves on the fence right now uh, for, for the last few months and for I expect the coming few months. So activity is down, but I don't expect in the, in the mid or long term 
there to be a, a, a negative impact as a result of, of COVID or as a result of the recession. I think that this is the one sector that I think is going to stay strong for the foreseeable future. Dennis, here, Doug Taylor here. We got a question from the, uh, the audience and actually it came about initially with the previous poll. One audience member says, the poll doesn't say if kids are back in school, that impacts. And then a, another audience member asked, is there any movement on schools leasing space to add more classrooms to accommodate for smaller classes? Uh, Doug, I'll, I'll take a, a quick stab at that just to tell you what we're doing on, on a couple of our properties. And we're doing it more for our employees, but for our employees who have children, uh, we're taking a few of our spaces that are kind of indoor, outdoor, and kind of suitable for a classroom for, for primarily middle to high school kids. And uh, the parents are organizing uh, tutors and folks to come in to kind of teach the kids three, four hours a day as a place for them to go during the, during the, during the day. And we're just donating the space uh, to these families to do that. So that's something that we're just doing in our portfolio in a couple of locations where, where it kind of works and where children are nearby. But I don't know if any of you have heard any other schools actually leasing space. I'm not. But. Great, thank you. Um, Andy, uh, obviously the, the silver lining for commercial real estate is both industrial, multifamily, long term is probably fine, but the big, I'm gonna call it a winner, I don't think anybody wins in COVID, but I think the net beneficiary of COVID has gotta be the life science space. And that's a space that San Diego is very well known for. And you're, you're making your career essentially as using life science as kind of the cornerstone of that. Give us the what up in, 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 in life science, why San Diego, how's it going? You know, give us some stats and some demand and some where does it all go and how long is it going to last? And is this going to be what we can kind of ride our coattails on? Yeah. And, and you know, I think it's, it's interesting, like early March, late February, when this was starting to, the wave was starting to hit, um, there was a lot of, even from the ownership side, tenant side, hesitation, you know, nervousness, but about 30 days into it, they realized that the activity was stronger. I mean, it, it's crazy. You track anywhere from 1.2 to, 1.34 million square feet of active life science deals in San Diego at a time. Um, and they just kind of turn through the, the pipeline, but the, it's always like at that level. Um, at, <laughs> like, I think it was April, May, we were tracking almost close to like 1.8, 1.9 million feet. So, you know, com in comparison to everything else that was going on that pretty much ground to a halt at that time, the life science industry was just on fire. I mean, there was, there's, there's a lack of space. There's just increased demand. Um, you know, I think a lot of that has to do with the funding that's been going on over the last few years. You know, these companies all are pursuing, pursuing, you know, treatments or cures for things like cancer and stuff like that. That's not going away whether COVID's here or not. So, you know, they have a business plan to, to, to work through. Their investors are expecting that. If they got funded with $200 million five months ago, there's really no impact and laboratory work can't be done in your garage at home. So it's got to be done at the facility, um, you know, things like that. So there's just, you know, our second quarter stats came out and I think we, we ticked down um, from like a seven, I think it was like a 7.8 to a 7.6 direct vacancy level on, on all of the life science markets. You know, there's some projects that kind of skew that a little bit, but you know, the fact is, is, you know, vacancy rates are all time low. Rents are going to all time highs. Um, we're, we're tipping things above 525 a foot, triple net and um, Torrey Pines, you know, which is never seen the likes of that before 2012. We were looking at, you know, deals getting done at 275, $3, $3 was a high water mark at some point sometimes. So, um, you know, I think, I think a lot of it just has to do with it's, it's a little bit bulletproof because of the fact that, you know, um, there's diseases and, and things that need cure still and treatments that need to come about and, and things like that. And these guys have long-term visions of, you know, drug production and things like that. So, um, do you see, do you see this? So it, it feels to me that, you know, like to your point, there's a lot of venture capital pouring into the life science space. It's been that way for quite some time now, and now it's even more, more acute. Um, obviously we've San Diego was the, the 
one of the three major life science areas in the, in the country. Um, and then we've got this whole COVID thing, which seems like it just gave it even more tailwinds. Obviously not everyone's looking for a vaccine in San Diego, to your point, it's other, other, other initiatives as well, but is it sustainable without COVID? I mean, it, it, because there's so much capital, I mean, as, a, as someone who's in, in the market, we see so much institutional capital pouring into the real estate side, but it's almost like the perfect storm between the real estate side and the venture side to kind of pro promote this growth. Is that sustainable? From your perspective, or and Gary, if you've got a, a thought on that, by all means, jump in. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think it's sustainable to a point. I mean, you, you have all the research institutes here, right? That's that's planted the flag and the anchor here. It's not going away. Um, groups want to be near that. Same thing in Boston. Same thing in San Francisco, uh, which are just historically high, you know, strong markets right now as well um, for life science, at least. Um, you know, I think it. I think it is. I think the one thing that's the big question mark, and Gary, you probably have a lot of thoughts on this. I feel like I get a call like probably once to twice to three times a week from from operators or capital partners looking to get into San Diego on the life science real estate side, and 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 they've never done it before. So like you have that kind of, you know, Dennis, you'll appreciate this. You know, with being in you know, in that in that office sector as well. They have to understand that they could be you know funding. 200 to $250 a square foot of TIs to a company that's three years in existence, that's raised $50 million um, and is well, you know, very much pre-revenue, you know, and the risk there. And those companies can't put up more than a, you know, a month or two security deposit and a letter of credit, you know, they're not going to get the full guarantee of, of those improvements. So um, I think that's kind of what separates the groups that are trying to get into it. Everyone's thinking about it from large to small operators to big funds and things like that. I think there's a, there's a high barrier to entry plus the scarcity of options, you know? Well, I, I agree. I mean, as I said before, um, there's the uncertainty certainly bleeds into this sector as, as um, in, in, in a greater way, just because of the level of risk associated with it. Prior to COVID, we, we um, had been involved in a couple of very large, uh, uh, what I'll call sort of biotech projects in the traditional areas in uh, Torrey Pines uh, along the uh, 56 corridor that, um, you know, again, our long-term propositions, master plan, biotech anchored projects. So I expect that those will still go on. But uh, in San Diego, what's really interesting is, um, I don't know how many of you are aware of it, but um, the Manchester deal at the Embarcadero is an escrow with a biotech reef. And that's a million square feet of office space that could form a cluster, a, 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 a biotech cluster in downtown, which is the major missing ingredient to the renaissance of office, of the downtown office market, which has been in 20 years of hibernation relative to uh, the rest of the region. I mean, we've grown something on the order of 35 million square feet of office space uh, in San Diego since the beginning of the century, none of which was built on, hardly any of which was built downtown, maybe 700,000. And so with the Manchester project potentially becoming a biotech uh, center, coupled with the Horton Plaza redevelopment and some other major projects, we might see a, the birth of a whole new cluster uh, that would be, um, that would be uh, all in for this sector. So uh, that, that should be really interesting. Yeah, get, I might Gary, get you back to your office, Gary. <laughs> Gary, you're you're 100 right on that. You know that's an interesting point to bring up, um, and it's it reminds me of the Boston market with Seaport. You know where uh, you know I think it was Joe Fallon was the developer of that, and they put Vertex in there for like God, I think it was a million square feet originally. Now you can't find space in Seaport, and it's a, it's a new biotech hub. You know which before no one ever thought there would be. You have to get that one large user that comes into that space and everyone kind of seeds around them. You know, like Vertex, I think, created like an incubator space within Seaport, um, which helps kind of spawn out groups of, of, you know, startups and things like that. So I think it's going to be interesting to see because everyone's trying to figure out where that next spot is. Is it, you know, the 56 corridor? Is it downtown? Is it just more expansion of Sorrento further east? Things like that. So. Well, it might be all of that. Um, yeah. uh, but, but again, the, the downtown office uh, recovery has been very disappointing. I mean, we have major success in downtown redevelopment, but it's almost all been residential. And that was not predicted. And, and so the office renaissance 
uh, could be, I should say the biotech sector could be the key to office renaissance. And it's tough to start a new cluster um, in, in any sector, but it, but it looks like it's got, um, uh, it's got some money and some momentum behind it if this, de if this deal closes with, uh, on the Manchester Embarcadero project. Dennis, we have a question from the audience uh, along those lines. And the question is, will AI and simulation reduce the square footage needs for life science office space? Andy? I, I would agree with Gary on that. I, I don't think so. Um, I mean, there may be the, some sort of impact, but is it going to be a needle mover? I don't, I don't suspect it. But. Yeah, you can't simulate chemistry. It's hard. Um, I mean, some of it you can, but I, th these guys have labs. So I think this is, the, I think that's the one uh, brick, and, uh, one bulletproof brick and mortar sector that should be sustainable. Rene, uh, on to uh, probably one of the hardest hit sectors uh, in this whole situation, and that's retail. Obviously, hospitality has been hit, um, but we know that over time that will presumably come back just because it's until we have a vaccine, et cetera. But retail had headwinds before with e-commerce and a variety of other issues. We're over retail. Now we have COVID. What, what are your collections been like in that space? And what do you see as kind of the, what, what's, is there anything that's bulletproof in that area? Or just give us your perspectives on retail and then I'll ask Gary a question as well. Sure, great. Um, in regards to collection, you know, it's really been kind of a mixed bag. Um, we have, uh, you know, properties that are maybe at 65% collections and other that are 100% collections. Um, again, I think we have a huge false positive going on. I think most of the money that we're receiving for rent is from the PPP. Um, and so I think uh, retail is going to have uh, some significant challenges in the long run. Um, Obviously, the strong ones are, you know, grocery and uh, pharmacy, you know, those, those, you know, CVS's, Walgreens. I mean, I actually used to at one point going, God, how many pharmacies do we need? Because, you know, they were like on every corner. But now it's like, oh, my gosh, that what a great investment right now for those who own those properties. Um, so, you know, obviously, everything that you see in the paper, gyms, hair salons, you know, those are all being hard hit. You know, a lot of our clients are mom and pops, um, and they seem to be the ones who are working harder at paying their rent. I would say that our um, biggest challenges, at least from what our commercial PM team is telling me, is that um, it's our national tenants that are, are the most difficult to deal with. Even if they're open for business and doing business, they're just like, we're not paying you. So, um, so uh, it's been some interest. That was a little bit surprising. You would think your national tenant would be a little bit more, <clears throat> have a little bit more money there. But, um, but uh, that, that's probably been you know, one of the challenging areas. Gary, um, so we, we've got Main Street, we've got malls, we've got different types of malls, different centers, all are impacted by, by what's going on in retail. I guess it's beyond COVID, but COVID has just really accelerated, you know, kind of much of what's going on. What happens to that re real estate? Well, this is where my evolution to revolution comment really plays, plays out. I mean, prior to COVID, a major part of our business was in working with owners and developers, uh, owners of, of, um, of retail shopping centers, big and small, in helping to transform them into something else, uh, either, either residential or office uh, footprints that are much larger in the compression of the retail component. And, and we were doing this uh, um, in, in, in projects across the country. And, and, uh, and with, the, with the environment where we've all had to be at home and have had to um, resort to online purchases to a large extent. That's where the revolution um, uh, comes in and we're, we're seeing that um, it's greatly impacted bricks and mortar shopping centers. So the answer is that we're gonna see a continuation at a much more uh, uh, fast paced level of the compression of, the, of retail space at every level. Um, with some exceptions, I mean, there are successful uh, fashion-based retail centers that are sustainable, like in San Diego, Fashion Valley is the one example I would point to. But Mission Valley is going to become, uh, you know, a mile, two miles away is going to become a mixed-use project with a much smaller retail footprint. On the strip side, on the commercial side, we're going to see, I think, a lot of verticality, a lot of residential above and um, a lot of mixed use transformation from what was exclusively re retail there. 
but uh, we were over retail before COVID. We're over retail today, and we're going to be significantly over retail after COVID, coupled with our increased comfort with getting items and goods to us at, um, from the things we need to the things that we want uh, uh, delivered to our doorstep. I mean, that's only going to increase at a, at a more rapid pace, and that's going to uh, significantly continue to impact the bricks and mortar environment. I don't think anybody is, um, is immune to the changes that we're seeing right before our eyes. And as we okay. have a question from one of our audience members, uh, can you share any successful creative ideas seen in the retail and or office sectors, any temporary trends that could, could become permanent? I, I just, uh, you know, I, you're, you're seeing it out there already. I mean, obviously, I mean, when Gary was talking about retail, one of the, you know, one of the things that, you know, you would really notice, at least in San Diego, is all the restaurants, right? We like to go out to dinner. We like to meet for drinks. We like that interaction. We like to be outdoors um, and, and, and dine outdoors. And so, um, so what we're seeing is a lot of restaurants that we have, you know, we've allowed them to use sidewalks and parking lots and creating outdoor environments. And we have um, a property up in Rancho Bernardo that even all of the restaurants together have created this whole outdoor area that's really, you know, drawing people in. It's been busy. People want to go out and, but they want to be safe. And so um, I think that's probably one of the most creative, you know, things is, you know, taking it outdoors and, and, and also having the, um, ABC and having all the other governmental agencies being okay and very quickly being okay with letting like restaurant use be outside and operating that way. Yeah, I, I, would, I would jump on the same thing, Renee. Kudos to the ABC for um, getting behind something that they heretofore would have never gotten behind. And, and obviously they're doing it for, you know, kind of under the guise of we're all in this together, but kudos to them for allowing that. But Gary, you had a comment. No, I just wanted, I think, again, I think Renee is spot on with respect to the restaurant sector. Uh, what we have to remember about retailing, um, uh, women understand this better than men, but shopping is a form of recreation. And that's, it's not going to go away just because we're, we're, um, we're painting a, um, a sort of a negative picture on retailing right now. It's never going to go away. People want to be out there. They, uh, they want to be shopping. They, they, they want to explore. We're just going to have to get through this period right now, particularly in the retailing sector. And the example that is best to show what is possible is the restaurant sector, because it's really fun right now to go to Little Italy or to go to the gas lamp or go to, to even suburban shopping centers and see people put artificial grass on tables outside. That's great. It's good for San Diego because our weather accommodates it. We'll see what happens in G December and January if we don't conquer this thing and people can you know, do some things back indoors. But that, that sets the pace. It's gonna be, that's more, obviously more difficult for retail. So I guess the point is, is that this is an opportunity for even retailers to, to be really, really creative. I mean, amidst the, um, the failures of the big box retailers, there's going to be a, um, uh, out of the ashes, there's going to be a renaissance of new kinds of retail. And we just don't all know what that is going to be yet. We have another question, guys, since, since on this topic, do the panelists see opportunity in warehouse, refrigerated warehouse, due to the increase in grocery delivery in San Diego County? Andy, do you have a thought there? You know, I would have to think so. I mean, I, like it, it's kind of above my pay grade on the, you know, on the cold storage type of stuff, but um, I, I mean, there's a lot of FDA climate controlled, you know, warehouse sites around that already are getting inquiries and things like that. So I would have to think, I don't know, Gary, probably, you've probably studied this, I'm sure. Well, on the border, you know, we're seeing more of that. I'm glad that you mentioned cold storage in the context of food and not coffins. That's there's in answer to that question, we're seeing a, a, a large thrust and it's the, it's the typical, uh, last mile users that would be looking for cold storage. But yes, there's a definitely a demand, high demand for that space. And that space is very expensive to reproduce. But yes, that you'll see, you'll see, you will see probably more ground up than you would see conversions of existing due to the nature of the cold storage uh, infrastructure. 
Yeah, this, this is tough on the coast because it's, it's hard to build these big horizontal um, projects al uh, along the coast, expect, except in places like uh, Otay Mason along the border. So you're going to see a lot more of that inland in Southern California. Um, Ellen, we have another last survey, and this is when do you all think you're going to get back to your office? And we, we already asked the remote one, but Ellen, if you could put that one back up, it'll facilitate the discussion on when that is. Okay, so it looks like we are, I'm going to call it 30% are when we have a vaccine or a therapeutic, basically when we all feel, I'm going to call it bulletproof safe or relatively bulletproof safe. Another 30% January 1 and call it another 23% September 1. So it's, it's a little over the board, but I would say call it a third, a third, a third, a third in the fall, a third in January, and a third when there's a vaccine. That's a little rough, but that's kind of how it breaks down to some degree. Um, and then obviously the kid thing is a great point that someone made earlier in, in one of the, the questions in the chat, but to, the, to our panelists, um, when do we return and, 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 and what, what do you think and what's your view? And again, put, put aside the remote working, but when we're all kind of back in our offices, uh, rocking and rolling. Well, I'll just set the table here and repeat what I said earlier, which is when the vaccine comes out. I think and, and that was one of your one thirds. And I think that the January uh, portion of the policy is really the same answer. Because um, most, most media reports are suggesting that's when we can expect the vaccine. So I think that's when, that's when um, uh, governments will lift restrictions. I think that's when we'll all feel a lot more comfortable um, I think that's the answer. Renee? Yeah, but even before Gary spoke, I thought beginning of next year, and um, you know, I'm not, not so certain it's necessarily tied to um, the vaccine, but I think between the vaccine and you know, a number of people getting the illness and building up some potential immunity to it um, beginning of next year. Andy? Yeah, I would agree. I, I think January, I mean, you know, just from hearing from other companies, things like that, different groups, I, I think January is definitely the date. I mean, there's people want to wait and see what's going to happen this fall. Um, you know, people are used to working remotely. I think some of the, the essential people are able to gather as needed, but it seems like it's going to be January. That's my guess. So I, I'm assuming everyone on the panel is over COVID. We're all, we're over it. We want it to go away. And now all of you are saying, you know, you know, Gary saying vaccine that could, you know, that could be, who knows what that could be next July, that could be a year from now. And Andy and Renee are saying even, even January, what do people do and how do we deal with our careers and our lives? And it, it, it things have gotten really jumbled since last March. And how are we, how are we dealing, seriously, from a career perspective, how do, how do you deal with that? Well, I also, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Renee. Okay. You know, I'll just kind of speak up in the property management world. I mean, in, a, in, the, in the career side of it, um, property managers are, ex, you know, getting more experience on things that they've never imagined than, you know, right now. And so it's a, a huge growth opportunity for experiences in property management, but it's, it's absolutely exhausting on top of it. So there's, there's, uh, there's pros and cons to it. Yeah, and I think the big thing from, at least from the brokerage side, you know, for for younger brokers and people coming into the business, a lot of them, they learn so much just from hearing, you know, conversations and the actual, you know, FaceTime of sitting down and going through things and going to meetings, going to tours and things like that. I think that's going to, I don't know if it's necessarily going to cause a gap, but I think it, it we're going to have to figure out new ways to kind of connect on stuff like that. You know, if you brought someone on, in January, 
you know, that there's, they're, they're missing out a lot. I mean, they can learn over a zoom meeting, but you know, Dennis, you know, when you're in those meetings, you know, with, with a younger person and they're hearing the back and forth and the questions being asked and, you know, getting over the, whether it's the butterflies in the stomach of being in person and, and certain awkward moments or whatever, you know, stuff like that, I think they're missing out on. So we're just hopefully have to get back or, or figure out a way to get around that. Hey, Gary, you, you, it works for you. You've been around long enough to where you can work remotely, but you've got young people and up and comers. It's those are the people, I guess, to your point, Andy, that are the most vul not vulnerable, but need the more attention, I think, other than perhaps the property manager who's growing you know, through osmosis with all of this. But Gary? Yeah, and let me repair my, my earlier comment. As I'm thinking about it, I, I think that um, if people are willing to wear masks, and office environments become more comfortable um, because people are, are being sensitive to each other. Uh, that could uh, portend a, a, a people go, coming back into the office sooner. It, my own company, I mean, my guys are working together right now. And I think maybe, you know, they made that decision. I didn't, you know, I, I let it up to them because they want to be together for all the reasons that Andrew suggested. Um, I think what might be also a game changer is when these tests come out where you get immediate results and companies in the private sector have them. You know, if that happens before the vaccine, if Dennis is right and we don't see the vaccine until next spring or summer, I hope you're wrong, but if you are right, then I think that we have to um, be way more attentive to these tests, get the tests in the hands of all of us so that when people come in the office in the morning, they can get tested. And if there's some level of confidence associated with all that, coupled with the social distancing and the masks, then I think that we can, we can get to normal um, um, in, in a few months. So a lot, of it, a lot of it goes to science and our own ability to, to um, you know, to, to make changes. And I think in some markets, we're, we're more willing and able to do that. In other markets, we're not. Thanks. Um, so you've got a lot of people are affected by what's going on now. Uh, we're, we're obviously headed towards more difficult economic times. Uh, again, government causes due to their need to, to solve a, a virus and, and stem, the, stem the spread of the disease. If you were king for a day and you could kind of wave a magic wand within reason, what would you do to help stem the tide of the economic fallout and COVID and everything else? What, what would you do? What would be your policy, your, your main thrust as a leader if you, could, if you had that king for the day title? Andy? Wow. Um, I don't know. I, th I think maybe pushing more of the some of the safety protocols or something like that. I, Cause I feel like that'll bring people back. I just, I don't know about policy, whether it's to pump more stimulus into the system. I think at the end of the day that you're going to have to figure out where you're going to, where you're going to deal with that on the back end. Um, I don't know. I, that's a tough question. It's kind of a, a loaded question too. I don't know if there's any right answer, right? But Gary, what do you think? Well, listen, we lost, we've lost this, this war. I mean, this, this, this disease is, is running through our, our nation and it's going to get, um, stay at least as bad as it is now, if not get worse for the coming months. You know, whether we're willing to admit it or not, that's where we're at. And I'm not sure that being king is going to solve that problem at all. So I think it's up to each of us personally to make sure that we have the, uh, maintain the highest level of responsibilities uh, for our, our families and for our businesses and, um, and, and, and do the right thing. Uh, and not, uh, you know, get politics out of it. Um, you know, I'll just be, you know, I'm very disappointed in, in, in government leadership. I think the election um, in November is huge. I think it'll have, the, the results will take us one direction or another. But in terms of being king, even if, even if um, we change presidents in November, I think it's really a function of, um, you know, the government helping with the repair. Not that, you know, there's not much more that can be done at this point on a non-scientific level. It's all about science from this point forward. Renee? 
so my focus would be on getting people back to work safely. Um, if we can have uh, people working and generating income, they can pay their rent, they're gonna support retail restaurants, they're gonna go to the dentist, they're gonna go to the doctor, they're gonna do all the things that will re-stimulate our economy. So whatever that magic is to get people back to work safely is where I would spend my energy and my money. Okay, very, very good. I think we're, let's shift the discussion a little bit more to uh, some of the career development aspects. Obviously, CCAM and IRM are, are just phenomenal at helping development of careers and development of our industry. Um, what advice do either of you, any of you have, specifically Andrew and Renee, for, for people wanting to become managers or brokers, what, what kind of advice do you have what kind of skills are needed, strengths? And you, you, you were so good to point out, Renee, that you're learning on, on the fly now. People are learning on the fly just with all new things being happening. I think the same would apply uh, on the on the brokerage side, although to a lesser degree because the activity level is so, so lessened. But what advice do you have for, for folks? Renee? Well, I would say, you know, if you're, if for those who are interested in property, interested in property management, um, Gee, we need you. We need you. Um, we uh, there was already studies are done that there's going to be a shortage of property managers. Um, we I know we've had to hire different positions. Um, are you know we're considered essential workers, so we're out there doing the thing. Now, property management's unique, right? I talked about drinking from a fire hose. Like it's crazy to start with, and it's super crazy right now. And so the right um, the right people are those I believe who are you know are just kind of who are smart and they're driven that they actually care about people. Um, they're, uh, and they work well under pressure and um, can be adaptable to new environments because you've kind of got to just bob and weave. This is also a great time. Um, if you're interested in property management, IRM has um, produced you know, a lot of online courses, seminars um, that can be taken to help get some base knowledge. Um, of property management, but a lot of um, property management companies have positions uh, that, you know, I know we hire people without experience. Like we want the right person and we can train you on the industry side of it. So uh, I think it's a, it's a good opportunity if you're committed to property management, you know, get in there, start networking via Zoom and the phone and talking to people and looking at, you know, IRAM, what does IRAM have to offer? And there's a lot to offer to assist you with your career and with your networking. Andy, how about on the brokerage side? What what advice do you have? I, I think you really have to evaluate the the firm that you're gonna, especially when you're, you're younger, getting in the business. You really need to take a look at the firm you're going to because, you know, times are changing right now. Um, you know, there's there's a big shift in, you know, just companies that are gonna make it, companies that aren't. I think um, consolidation, things like that, and then you gotta you gotta understand where you're going for as far as training. You know. Um, you're going to have a rough couple of years probably ahead of you. I mean, brokerage is, I don't know if you remember Dennis, when you got into it, the first couple of years, you're, you're out knocking on doors, pounding the pavement. And right now is probably a pretty tough time to do that. Um, so you got to be prepared for that for the next, usually they say it's a three year window of kind of making it or not. I think it's going to be a little bit longer than that. Um, and you got to realize, you know, that you're, that you're going to have to work really hard, I think, to get up on it because, you know, a lot of, there's going to be a lot of competition, you know, with seasoned brokers that are, that are reaching down smaller square footages, things like that, you know, um, and competing. So I think there's going to be a lot of, a lot of that. And I think you really just got to evaluate where you could fit in and get some good, good mentorship and good training um, and in a strong um, environment. I, I know that Renee, you, you touched on it a little bit, but I know that we're all working remotely and we all think we're operating at 110%. We can get into that debate, whether that's true or not, because, but I would guarantee you that anyone working remotely that's not in their office or even in their office, given where we are right now, has probably an extra hour a day to do something, self-improvement of something. Mm -hmm. And Renee, you kind of touched on that a little bit. And I think now is a really unique opportunity to, to really sharpen your, sh sharpen your tools and really become something that you want to become or that you maybe otherwise didn't think you could achieve. You just, We've, we've got time now, which is which is something we normally don't have. Gary, do you have any thoughts on that? Because I, I view this as a really unique time, especially for younger people. I love that you said that, Dennis. I think that, um, and I, I touched on this in my opening comments, that I found that I had a lot more time, even though we're, our company's 
busy and we're operating on all eight cylinders right now. I had more time because we're not going places. And so that gives us, you know, and so you can choose your poison. I, I, choose, I choose to exercise more and to play with my kids more. And, but I'm also choosing to read more and to uh, write more and to uh, use this forum, these kind of forums to speak out. And, and, and I've got groups where we're um, testing ideas every day. So this is, this is where we're at. I, I think that um, just to button it all together, um, the, the, the time to make money in real estate are times like these when the markets are down. And the people that do well are people that can uh, sort of muster and embrace that creative aspect uh, of themselves and figure out what the future is going to be. Because what real estate is all about, it's not about the bricks and mortar. It's not about the pro formas. It's not about the management really, even those are all really, or brokers, all, those are really important aspects of the implementation of real estate. But what real estate really is all about is the box. And inside that box occurs all the activities that, human, that homo sapiens engage in. It's where we work, it's where we live, it's where we recreate, it's where we shop, all the things that we talked about today. So if you're able to use this time creatively to think about how all those things are going to change in the future, how we're gonna occupy those spaces, then you're in a position where you're gonna make better development decisions, better investment decisions, better management decisions, uh, uh, better brokerage decisions. And so um, what I would do is I would, um, I would urge all of you, particularly those of you who are younger and have a lot more years ahead of you than behind you, uh, to look upon this moment uh, a, 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 as the opportunity to, um, to try things. No one is ever gonna fault you for trying something and failing in an environment like this. No one's ever gonna say, you're so stupid. You shouldn't have done that. You just, you just go on to the next thing. This is the time to try things. And you have, you have a, a big window. You know, this, is a, this recovery period is going to take a few years until we get to sort of a restabilized point, I think, at least two years. So this is a moment to, uh, to be uh, embracing the period. And all the confusion that I've spoken about this morning will start to uh, clarify itself over, over, the coming, over the coming year. And that would be the time to strike, regardless of what part of the sector you're in right now. So I think it's important to be positive. And I think the long-term prospects in our, in our, in our, um, uh, in our sector are, are extraordinarily uh, good because this is a growing country, which, um, you know, regardless of the political turmoil that we're in right now, uh, we'll recover from all of that and we'll, be, we'll come out better. And that will present uh, lots of opportunities to, um, to do creative things in your career and to make money. Great, great, great comment, Gary. And that is a great segue into the last question. And by all means, anyone's got questions in the chat, please submit them, but we're nearing the end here. So one last question, at least from, from me, you've got a hundred million dollars, you got to invest in real estate. And Gary, thank you for the segue. This is perfect. Um, given where we are, given everything you know, where are you going to invest that hundred million dollars and why? Andy? I, it's probably an obvious answer for me. And Cape Cod, right? Cape Cod. <laughs> Cape Cod, yeah. yeah. Du duplexes yeah. in Cape Cod. <laughs> yes, you're right. True. I mean, the the the, the residential um, short-term rental market down here is incredible right now with everyone trying to get away from the cities, but it's it's impressive. But no, I, I mean, for that question, Dennis, I would I would have to say, I mean, just kind of what just what I know. I mean, I I would I would pursue, you know, the life science real estate. Um, just because it's something that I know. I mean, who knows? I'd take Gary's uh, Gary's advice and go do something kind of out there that I'm not afraid to fail at because it's acceptable at this point in time. But um, I would say, you know, go after, um, you know, similar to some of the, you know, the, the industrial product that you can convert in a solid market like Serrano Mesa, Serrano Valley, something like that, um, and see what you can do. I mean, I think with that much money, you'd probably be able to buy much more than a project. You'd probably buy on a campus. Renee? Yeah, I had a, a difficult time with this question, so I'm going to shift it a little bit. So if I had $100 million, um, what would I do with it in real estate? I would want to try to do something maybe philanthropic. How could I invest that money to help people? And is that in life science? Is that in housing? Where, where could I invest that money that potentially for the greater good 
um, it can help people. And so it's kind of a different type of answer, but that's what, came, that's what came to me. Gary? I'm gonna invest it with you, Dennis. <laughs> No, I, I would, uh, it, I, my other thought that came to me is I'll, I'll invest in, in uh, purchasing all of Trump's failed golf courses and hotels, but put, put that, put that aside. Um, no, actually, I think that um, I liked, uh, I'm going to piggyback on Andrew's comments about conversion. I think that the real opportunities going forward are in um, discovering underutilized or reutilizable real estate um there's not you know we've had a flight to the suburbs anyway so i mean whether viruses whether COVID has catalyzed that or not remains to be seen but i think that there's tremendous opportunities in the suburbs to um uh to look at old real estate and, and uh, invested at uh undervalued real estate invested and do something uh, do something different with it. I mentioned obviously retail shopping centers are a huge area, but there's underutilization uh, sort of across the real estate spectrum and in, uh, in strip commercial and shopping centers in um, uh, maybe even old hotel properties because we might be over hotel for the, for the coming future. So I, I would think that underutilization geographically, um, I think that the, that the places that um, I would be concentrating on would be the places that, that you know, would be obviously in our backyard. I mean, Southern California is going to con continue to, um, to grow and prosper. So while the grass is always greener to go geographically somewhere else, I'd probably uh, stick to, 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 my ge to my geography here. But I think the other thing is, is not to uh, limit your investment aspiration to, uh, to that which the zoning tells you has to be done in that site. You can always change. This is the opportunity time to change zoning um, and to find new uses for old sites. So those are the areas that I'd concentrate in. I see that Doug and Lucinda are back, which must mean we're getting the hook, you guys. Thank you so much for Andrew and Gary and Renee. Thanks, you guys did a great job. Uh, and turning it over to you, Doug and Lucinda. Wonderful. I thought I'd jump back in because I am a broker and I heard $100 million was about to be spent. So I figured it was timely. Uh, but no, serious guys, this has been amazing. Uh, on behalf of CCIM and IRAM San Diego, a big thank you to our panelists this year, Dennis, Renee, Andrew, and Gary. Uh, you know, your generosity with your time and experience, truly appreciated. Uh, and to all of our attendees, be sure to visit the websites uh, for the San Diego chapters of CCIM and IRAM for our future events. And we look forward to seeing all of you real soon. Be happy or be healthy and happy and have a great week. Now, before you jump off, Thank you. Lucinda has some special announcements. So I'm going to pass it on to Lucinda. Lucinda? Thanks so much, attendees. Don't go anywhere quite yet. I mentioned that IRAM San Diego has some amazing um, industry partner sponsors, and we have some raffle prizes that they have donated for us. Renee, are you able to show these raffle prize winners, please? And I'll announce them. Not Renee, I'm sorry, Nicole. Um, Harbro Emergency Services and Restoration. Gary Griffin has donated a $50 Amazon gift card, and the winner is Mary Rice, CPM. Mary, we'll get that sent to you. Um, AMS Paving from Adela Gonzalez, a $50 Visa e-gift card. And the winner is Tim Arnold, CPM. Highlights of San Diego, Gary Patterson, thank you. Two $25 gift cards. Winners are Maya Robinson and Monica Jones. Keith Monroe Painting, Eric, thanks so much. Two $50 Starbucks gift cards. Winners are Craig Ivanko, CPM, and Christy Young. And from Stephanie Kozlowski at Paragon Services, a $50 e-gift card to Postmates. Winner is Ashley Cosentino. Debbie Palumbo at Sherwin-Williams has donated a $50 e-gift card to Grubhub. The winner is Devin Ponzi Ponzi. I hope I pronounced that right. Sully Jones from Joseph Dela Cruz, a $50 Amazon gift card. The winner is Steven Beichinger. He is an ARM. 
Thank you everyone for joining us. And again, as Doug said, please visit local websites for CCIM and for the Institute of Real Estate Management. Let us know how we can be of service to you. Have a great day.